We're back from Indianapolis at the NFL Combine. It's another episode of Big Blue Kickoff Live presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Football Giants. John Schmelk, Paul Dottino, Madeline Burke. A busy show coming your way today. We'll have Charles Davis. We'll have Dane Brugler. We'll have Brad Spielberger doing all the free agency stuff. And then we'll wrap it up with Art Stapleton. But first, we want to bring Madeline on here to talk about everything that gets said at the podium earlier today, Mads. We had defensive line and yeah. linebackers talk. Yeah. So a lot of large gentlemen that were uh, very impressive. Yeah. Uh, what were your main takeaways? Well, my main takeaways is, I first of all, I can't decide which nickname I like better, Chop or Loaf. Um, well, it's Chop and Nick. I think that's just Chop? his name. No, it's a nickname well, because what's his he was a 14-pound baby, and so they called him Pork Chop. Oh, I love But that. his family calls him, uh, what is it? Calls him, uh, hold on, Plump. There it is. So in at home, he's Ooh. Plump, but publicly he's Chop. What's his actual name? That I, well, you know, we'll get there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <You know? laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's that. That was a big one. Uh, but there were a lot of great storylines uh, along the way. And uh, you know what? We should make this change Yes, now. we're going to make the change. All and, right, and, well, and, we'll do this later. Yes, we're going to have Madeline I'm at the end of the show. The Charles, I'm passing the baton. I'm passing the baton. Come on and in. Charles, I'm going to hand Charles, over. We're going we're, we're to slide you in over yep, there. Yes, yep, we're, we're going to slide you in. Got to get roller skates. We'll just roll you right in. We're doing the talk. Charles Davis doing his best chivalry, but I insist. Sir. No, slide, slide on in, Charles. Slide on in. We got you here. Absolutely. <laughs> we have our very good friend, Charles Davis. He, of course, is part of NFL Network's coverage of the NFL Combine this week. You can check it out uh, all day long. You have NFL Insiders. You got Good Morning Football. And then Combine coverage begins on Thursday. Uh, drills begin at 3 o'clock, and we'll have those yep. defensive linemen and linebackers um, we were just talking about on. And now we welcome in good friend of the program, Charles Indeed. Davis. It's so good to see you guys. How have you been? This, this was oh, like man. a fire drill trying to kick that field goal before the gun. <laughs> can, can, you get, can you get it off? Are you going to get enough? height <laughs> did you not jump when you came out there did you count to 11 not 12 or 10 there you go all those things that go with as you guys well know but madeline should be, she should be in here no she'll be back it's all right. She'll I mean, be back later in the show. All I know is we'll get you, all her nuggets. I can just tell you right. You guys are going to hear about this. If like, hold a second, you kicked her out for him. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? You guys got to make better decisions. Better decisions. It's great to see you guys. You as too, Charles. It's good always. to see you. It's so much. It's so much fun to visit with you. Um, I appreciate you both being able to see you during season. We always get a chance to chat yep, it always. up and talk it up. And you guys are so great to me, and I just greatly appreciate it. And yeah. Ditto. Let's, let's let's talk. Let's talk a little yeah. off season and draft. And, right? and we have, we have Charles for ten minutes. Day. We usually get him for a longer spot on Zoom later on in the draft process. We'll do that. Give me your 20,000 foot view of this draft class, Charles, because to me, there are more top 10 worthy blue chip prospects in this class than maybe the last two or three drafts yeah. put together. Yeah. I think that's how good the top of this class is. And bundling at positions too, right? Tackle I mean, quarterback, receiver, baby. There, there we go. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know how you guys feel, but uh, I've talked about this with Daniel Jeremiah, who you know I work with at NFL Network. We had him on uh, today I, on the John Tuttle. I, I yep. think he, I we think, heard him. He's, I think he's <laughs> the best. I mean, he, you know, I'm biased because I work with him. There are a lot of great draft experts out there, a lot of people who know their stuff. Daniel can work with it. Can be I put him up there at the top of the food chain, and and anyone else can can compete with that. But we've talked about this over the last three four years. I think that if football continues to be played the way we play it, is currently constituted where we pitch it, mm -hmm. we're we're going to have the same conversation until they remove us from the microphone. Endless wide hey, receivers. Hey boy, wide right? receivers are really loaded this year. <laughs> You're right because the kids are playing the position. The kids are getting reps. When we were kids, did you ever participate in a seven-on-seven -seven tournament? They did didn't you exist. ever participate in Never. a camp? Did no. you even know what it was? Other no. Seven-on-seven seven when we had practice, mm -hmm. but it wasn't long. Like like my coach, my, 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 my dearly departed head coach, John Ford at New Paul Tie. He'd give me a seven-on-seven seven position. It'd last about four throws, and he'd be like, all right, let's get back to, let's get back to isolation. Let's get back to nine-on-seven, you know, because that's the way the game was played. We played it within the hash marks. We beat each other up. The kids that you saw in the neighborhood playing touch or tackle football, the numbers they were wearing were runner back, running back numbers because those were the heroes. Sure. When we handed them the ball, they were the featured people. Nowadays, the quarterbacks in, when we were younger were college quarterbacks that pitched it off the option, 
Mm -hmm. Now they pitch it downfield, and the guys making the glamour plays are those guys out on the perimeter doing it. So, And the tight end has, has emerged as that guy, too. I do think the top of this class, though, is better than even last year, oh, right? I yeah. mean, for sure. I mean, th these are like legit special Which is crazy, wide right? receivers. Because last year wasn't bad. No, it was not bad at all. Not That's correct. Not bad at all, but now you're talking Marvin Harrison Jr. You're talking about Malik Neighbors. You're talking about Roma Dunze. You're talking about now, now you want to put in there Brian Thomas from LSU. I mean, that's just as we start at the top. I now like A.D. Mitchell and Troy Franklin, too. Troy dude. Franklin, right? I love Franklin. <laughs> right? Listen, how about a kid out of Texas A&M named Anaya Smith? Have you seen him attack I have not the watched football him yet. No. and no. return punts? This guy attacks mm. Malachi Corley, the receiver from Western Kentucky, mm -hmm. built like Debo Samuel, plays similarly. You will watch him at the end of catches attack the defender to drop a shoulder to get more yards. I talked to him receiver. in Mobile. I was standing next to him. He's built like Saquon. He's built like him, he right? He looks big like thighs, Saquon. Thighs, big, crazy. compact build, the whole thing. I mean, we, if we're going to talk about that, I mean, I actually made some notes last night. I'm very impressed by the look notes. Look at Ke Keon Coleman, the receiver out of Florida yep, State. Yep. He came out of Michigan State. When you first looked at him, I just got to ask you both because, you know, I rely on your brains, all right? A uh, big mistake. When you, when you first looked at him, <laughs> did you have that sense of, oh, he's one of those jump ball receivers? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then you watched him. And you went, oh, okay, he can do a little bit more. Can't little, 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 little different. <laughs> right? A little I, different. I got to be honest with you. I still think he's a little bit of a jump he, ball he's receiver. Got, he's got that in yeah. him, but I saw a little bit more. I'll put it to you this way. Who was the kid who came out of uh, Stanford? If you, J.J. Ortega Whiteside? Yeah, he's not that. I remember him. No, he's I, not that. I said he is a 20, he's a red zone jump ball guy, period. No, Coleman's right? more than that. Correct. He's more than that, mm -hmm. but the jump ball is a big part of his game. Big. Okay. Jalen Polk. Have you seen him, Jalen Polk, out of out of Washington? I, Woo, just I a like, little. Just I a honestly little. like McMillan more than I like Polk. Right? I think McMillan, like? McMillan no. his teammate. Oh, I think McMillan's really that's good. That's another good one, Ooh, right? I like him. But, but, <laughs> but just think, that's three on the same team we're talking about. <laughs> oh, I know. That's University of Washington. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. Okay. The Pac-12 this year was good. I can't believe it's gone. Oh, right? No, that's but, but, another story. But how about the another way show. They, how, how about the way they went out? That was a good, good group. Like, pick your team. Pick what's going on. Look, the kid who's going to Florida State, played quarterback, D.G. Uangala, had a heck of a year at Oregon State last year. Mm -hmm. Oregon State had a heck of a year. They were so good, they got their coach job at Michigan State, Jonathan Smith. And by the way, Jonathan Smith is a graduate of Oregon State, and he took the Michigan State job. Mm. You know, it's just, it's just how it works. Anyway, moving on. Charles, something that doesn't make sense to me, and we've been talking about me the Me sitting Darth here instead of Madeline? <laughs> I mean, that's... That's the first one. <laughs> you're really beating yourself up now, aren't that's, you? That's, that's the no, first thing. But think I'm just about this. You're going to hear from the people. But think about this, right? Yes. You just talked about the fact that we're going to see these passing game skill position yeah. guys for the next how many years, right? Till til they shovel dirt on me. But, but. For the last several years, we've been talking about the Darth of offensive line prospects right. coming into the NFL, and yet this draft Loaded. is full of them up top. Loaded. How do you explain that when in the younger football groups they're just teaching people to just wing it around the field? That's a great. That's a great, great question. And the only way I can only way I can explain it is, in each conference, there's a subset of coaches that values still being physical. And part of that is when you go so far one way, which we have with spread offenses, throw it around 60 times, all that. Linebackers at 210 pounds. Linebackers 210 pounds. There's always one coach that goes, hmm, <laughs> let's go counter. You see it on Saturdays, don't you? Right? Oh, I, in right? my right? – yes, right? right? I see it. Right? And you're, right? I see you, it. You, you see, you're like, oh, they've seen it, right? Sock it to me, baby. Okay. <laughs> yeah, go, go ahead and put, it at two, put that 205-pound guy in there and let's see what happens. That's and right. And they go counter and they build up that group and they, and they do it. You have some who can do both. Like when you watch a Georgia play. Mm -hmm. Georgia can beat you up running the ball. Georgia can throw the ball. Michigan can beat you up running the ball. Michigan can throw the ball under, under Jim Harbaugh. And I'm sure it will continue under Sharon Moore. I remember last year. Tell me if I'm wrong. I think I'm right on this one. Wasn't it the second half of the Penn State game that Michigan didn't throw the football? Yep. Mm -hmm. I think they sure threw was. one. Sure there was. was a penalty, so yep. it doesn't go into the yep. into the thing. Yep. They just ran it. They ran Penn State. Yep. Think about that now. Into oblivion. Mm -hmm. Penn State. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not that's not that's not, you know, I know Penn State. So that just tells you. So I think that there might be something to that that some of these coaches have figured it out. Like Chris Chris Kleiman, the Kansas State, mm -hmm. North Dakota State guy. He's going to line up and hit you 
He's going to line up and run the ball. Deuce Vaughn ran it for him before. He's got, he's got people. And by the way, he's got an offensive guard named Cooper Beebe. who's pretty darn good. Uh, yeah. Pretty yeah, darn good. I think so. And they develop them. In some of those places, a Duke is developing a couple of offensive linemen. Graham Barton is their starting left tackle. Mm-hmm. I'm plugging him at center. And I'm starting him day one. He'd be a first-round pick. Yeah, he mm-hmm. might be a first-round pick. He can play the whole line. He can play the whole line. But I'm making him my pivot, just like I did with Creed wow. Humphrey, just like I did with uh, with uh, Tyler Linderbaum. He is my first round. I'm taking him, and I'm plugging him in at center, okay? I'm taking the kid out of West Virginia, Zach Frazier. He's going to start for me right away at center. Mm-hmm. These are those kids that are coming out now. I'm not wasting any time worrying about them. I'm putting them in. I'm turning them loose, and off they go. Yeah, and, and, I, and I understand that because with, with some of these pro teams that are now understanding you need to run it when we want to run it, well, that beef up front is necessary. It's necessary. Think about this. When we saw Kansas City at the end of the 2020 season and Tom Brady and Tampa Bay took their measure in the Super Bowl and beat them half to death because Patrick Mahomes was on the run mm-hmm. from warm-ups in that mm-hmm. game, right? After the ball game, I just talked with Andy Reid about this the other day, and I don't know that I'm getting information he hadn't said before, but it resonated this time with me. He said after the ball game, Brett Veach, the GM general manager, came into the locker room, talked to Andy, and said, I will never leave you with an offensive line like this again. Really? I will not do this. You remember what happened the next year? Traded Tyreek Hill. They traded Tyreek Hill, but what else did they get? Well, they freed up money to get Orlando money. Brown. And then so, right? so Orlando mm-hmm. Brown was at left tackle, right? They okay. got Joe, they got Joe Tooney, yeah, yeah. free agency. Yeah. They drafted Creed Humphrey, at, so, and the best sixth round draft pick other than Tom Brady, Trey Smith, Trey Smith at right guard, mm-hmm. and off they went. And they, they they allowed Andrew Wiley to move from guard to tackle, and they made that work. <laughs> look where the, look what yeah, happened well. with that. Wiley goes. They signed Jawan uh, Taylor. They signed Donovan Smith at left tackle. They make that work this year. But that interior three is where everything changed. And by the way, at the end of the season, were they throwing it or were they running it? They were running it. Isaiah Pacheco, seventh round pick. Andy Reid realized this made my team better. I have a defense that I'm going to play to. I'm not going to play hero ball. Patrick Mahomes, I'm going to say it again. The best quarterback play of his career was down the stretch and through the playoffs this year. I don't care what the numbers say. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about being a quarterback, mm-hmm. being the guy understanding his team, being the guy that takes, keeps the ball out of harm's way. He threw his first interception in seven playoff games in the Super Bowl just by it was a bad pass. Right. But they did it. They made the transition and won another well, Super Bowl. Well, the Lions behind Dan Campbell, same thing. And if, and by same the way, thing. And by the way, if the Lions ran it a little bit more, they would have been in the Super Bowl. Hey, they would have. They would have. <laughs> Charles, Great to see you this guys. is awesome, man. We're going to do it you. again? Yeah, yeah, we'll do We're it, gonna it again. We're going to do it again. Good, my friends. Anytime. Watch, watch <laughs> Charles on NFL Network's coverage of the combine. Madeline's coming back. The, the Madeline's the coming back. at 3 o'clock <laughs> on Thursday. Charles Davis will be back with more Big Blue Kickoff Live after this. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. All right, Charles. level with a season ticket membership and it's intercepted Deontay Banks you will receive exclusive benefits like members only events game day experiences and discounts on Giants merchandise at the team shop sacked by Thibodeau and the Giants have won to learn more about a New York Giants season ticket membership visit Giants.com slash tickets Most use emoji is either the laughing emoji or the crying emoji that I use when I'm laughing even extra harder. Something about me not a lot of people know would probably be that I'm a black belt. My favorite follow on social media is Rod Wave. You know, I feel like I'm a huge Rod Wave fan. He's from around my hometown, so you know, gotta follow him and see, see what he does with music he drops. My biggest pet peeve, man, I would say when people chew and they're like talking when they're chewing. This is fantastic. <laughs> Makes your taste buds come alive. And they're, if they're like dragging their feet when they walk, you know, my parents always instilled in me not to do that. So I'll probably say those two things. One. 
We're back here on Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football giants. Hey, giant fans, score a taste touchdown with Hellman's, the official mayonnaise of the New York football giants. Schmelk, Dettino, joined by longtime friend of the program, the one and only Dane Brugler. You can find his work on The Athletic. You can hear him on the Prospect to Pros podcast. And he is, I'm surprised he came out of his cave from working on The Beast to, <laughs> to show up at Indy. Uh, like a groundhog, you know. Every so often I have to pop my head up. And, what, yeah. what is The Beast status at the current time? Time. Uh, you know, we're probably what 70, 75 percent there. Nice. Uh, good. Yeah, good. really. Good. All Very the good. hay is in the barn at this point, right? Of the course. work yeah. has been done. It's just about uh, making sure we're getting the right guys uh, in the right range and getting the report right, getting all the background information. Pro day numbers, right? Big part of it, no mm -hmm. doubt. And so, yeah, it's uh, it's coming together. So that, that first week in April is always the goal, and uh, we'll find a way to hit it again this year. And we will have more. We'll have Dan on with a deeper dive when the beast comes out. We'll give that as proper uh, plug. I think, what was the first beast? What year did it come out? 2012? Uh, uh, truth be told, I've been doing it since my freshman year in college. But, yeah, the first year I, like, shared it with everyone was probably, <laughs> yeah, 2012. That's that's around, yeah. I, I believe we have a copy of that back in the shop. Oh, but gosh. Yeah, oh, well, no. We, we, we've been having Dan on here for a long time doing this. You're great. Um Paul, why don't you lead us off with this one? Yeah, I, I want to ask you a question about these quarterbacks because we have so many people in the transfer portal. So many of these top quarterbacks have played in more than one system, yeah. maybe even three systems, mm -hmm. different coaches, different coordinators. How difficult does that make your evaluation when you try to look at these guys as opposed to years ago where they were pretty much in one spot? Or is it easier? Uh, well, I will say that I do appreciate with this draft class, all these the top six quarterbacks, we've got a really clean two-year window with all of them. Because you look at Bo Nix, two years at Oregon. Michael Penix, two years at Washington. J.J. McCarthy, two years as starter. Caleb Williams now two years at USC. Uh, Jane Daniels, two years at LSU. Um, and then... Uh, Who's the one I'm forgetting? Drake May. He was two-year mm -hmm. starter at North Carolina. So we've got a nice – so, like, comparison purposes with different stats and metrics, it's, it's nice and clean. So I do appreciate that. But it's interesting. I think it really speaks to the journey of these guys. You know, the Bo Nix at Ar Auburn is not the same Bo Nix we saw at Oregon. Totally different. The Jane Daniels at Arizona State, completely yeah. different than the Jane Daniels we, we've seen at LSU. And there's so many factors. And I think that's the key point is – all the variables involved with scouting the quarterback position, understanding everything they've gone through. I mean, Jane Daniels, he didn't have the same play caller and the same system in back-to-back -back years until these past two years at LSU. And obviously we saw the result on the field and what that, what that led to. Um, Oregon, I thought, did a tremendous job really working towards Bo Nix's strengths as a, as a quarterback mm -hmm. and what he did best. So it's, and this is, it doesn't matter what level of football you're talking about. It's always – the play caller and what can you do to, for our quarterback in terms of making them comfortable. And, you know, we, uh, I've heard uh, Sean Payton talk about this, how, you know, when with my quarterback, I don't want him jumping off the high dive every single play. Now, there will be five plays a game where he's going to have to do that. But for the most part, I want him in the three-foot section. I want him just hanging out and being comfortable. And then when I need him to step up, he's going to be ready to do it. But I don't want him constantly have to make him – big play after big play um, and so I think the most productive quarterbacks we've seen the play callers really accommodate for them and we've seen that with in college football with what L happened at LSU what happened at Oregon um, Michael Penix at Washington you know the play callers have really been in sync with what they the quarterbacks do best and really to make sure they're maximizing those guys let me ask you about J.J. McCarthy because I know I don't know if you're higher on him the most but I think You've been saying for a while that NFL teams are going to be very yeah. high on him. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten through eight games. I got through, I think, the Nebraska game was the last you one You have to I watch them all. In order. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm getting there. Yeah. I'm, I, and I will get there. I could not finish before we got here. I tried. And I expected going into the tape to see a bunch of, oh, play action boot, you know, dump to the tight right. end. I expected to see a bunch of check downs. Dude, that dude just throws the ball into coverage. He don't care. <laughs> like, there is a lot of stuff where – they almost set him up for chunk plays. This is not throwing the ball mm -hmm. to gain four yards here, five yards there. This is downfield stuff, and I'm, I think his accuracy on crossing routes might be the best in the class. Yes. I think on crossers, he's excellent. Work in the middle of the field, absolutely. Really good. Yeah. Now, I don't know about the deep ball. At least in the first eight games of tape I saw, like there's not a lot of touch on the deep ball. Everything's a line drive. I, I yeah. don't see that great arc on the deep ball. And then, and, and Tony said this on, on our um, draft season podcast, some of those throws where he throws it into traffic, I wonder if in the NFL, 
are those coming the other way? Because he <laughs> just throws it, and guys are there, right. and either he's anticipating well, or is, you know, Lovecraft's unbelievable. He makes some really good catches, mm -hmm. but. It's, it's funny. He's, I think he's a pretty high-variance. He's not a conservative quarterback. He's almost a high-variance quarterback to me. I, I think he has a good feel for when he needs to be conservative, when he needs to just kind of let it loose. I mean, I think that, that touchdown in the Ohio State game on that tape where mm – -hmm. but he knew – from film, from film prep, that once 25 turned his head, yeah. he doesn't turn it back towards mm -hmm. the line of scrimmage. So once he knew that he, you know, because the 25 just turns around, it's an interception, take the touchdown off the board, and the game might be totally different. And that isn't the only play like that on his tape, right. by the way. But I think he, it's not just madness where it's like, oh, I'm going to, you know, right. like I think there's a method to his madness sure. because he understands what he can get away with, what he can't. Um, but yeah, I think with, my biggest thing with, with McCarthy, and, and, and to your point, he has... In my initial top 50 in August, he was 15, 16. I mean, he's been a guy that I've had high for a while because I know how teams feel about him. Um, I want to see him just be more complete in terms of getting through his reads. Yeah. Um, like, show me the tape where he's on his third read. You know, like, that. it's hard to find mm -hmm. those. I mean, heck, he, he throws a lot of plays where it's just a two-man route, and they're max protecting it, off a of play action. It, and, it's, and it's part of the design. You know, because yeah. they know, mm -hmm. okay, we're going to do pre-snap motion. Um, you know, they, they scheme guys open very well. And... What are you gonna do? Knock JJ McCarthy for that? Like you know, you're not you know that's not his his fault. Uh, he's taking what the defense gives him and he's making the most out of it. So you know you can't you can't really blame him. And it's the same thing with uh, you know they the way they built that offense. And yeah. you know you're really gonna ding him for that? Like it's not his fault. They built this offense to be uh, a power run game. And they won a national title doing right. that. Right. And to your point, he actually impressed me on third and longs. On third and longs, he's actually pretty third, good. Third and fourth down, he is the best. Uh, there uh, has the highest numbers in this class. Is that true? I didn't know that. Yeah, he has the best. I just noticed that on tape. On wow. money downs, he is the best quarterback in this class. Uh, wow. Third and fourth downs, and so that's that's something that you can point to and say, yeah, maybe he's not unleashing a forty-yard pass on second down, but on third and seven, he knows exactly where to go with the football, and he's accurate enough to do it. So. You know, you're you're talking about a guy with 700 dropbacks. Doesn't have a. You wish the body of work was more, but again, when you when it boils down, you like the traits, you like his decision making process, and I think the thing that is going to win uh, coaches over is just the intangibles, which this week is going to really shine for him. Uh, I I know fans hate it when you talk about win loss record for quarterbacks, but that's the first thing teams talk about with him. That he's a winner. High school, 36 and two, won a state championship. College, 27 and one as a starter, won a national championship. So this guy wins wherever he goes, and that might not matter to a lot of fans who hate hearing that. Uh, you know, just talking win loss record for a quarterback specifically, teams care about it. So it's a relevant stat. You know what's interesting though about that, Dane? I've I've had people around the league tell me they want to see a guy who's gone through adversity. Oh, sure. They want yeah. to know how did he deal with losing? Mm -hmm. How did he deal with getting beaten up and throwing interceptions? Because can he play from behind? Right. Yes. Another one. That yeah. tells me more about a guy who just went through his whole career as a winner. Sure. Uh, I I think you could point to the Alabama tape, and I mean it was down to the wire. It, it took a, a last minute drive by JJ McCarthy in that offense mm -hmm. in order to beat win that game and beat. Alabama so you know I think that uh, going you know being Ohio State two years in a row and uh, it wasn't all perfect for him you know and, and so but there's certainly validity to what you're saying because that's the biggest thing when you get to the next level is can you overcome the obstacles that's the biggest difference between a Zach Wilson and a Jalen Hurts you know Jalen Hurts after every mistake or rough patch in the road he was better for it right and you know if you can come out the other side because Failure is inevitable in the NFL as a quarterback. Mm -hmm. uh, it, but can you learn from it and get better? Then you've got a chance. But the guys that, that can't and kind of you know don't have that mental toughness, you're just not going to survive. But that's a common thread with bust, busted quarterbacks in the NFL is just not having that mental toughness. I don't want to put need aside, but we know it's going to change based on free agency. So mm -hmm. just focusing on the quality of the prospects, what would be your game plan for the Giants at number six? Hope Malik Neighbors falls to me. I mean, that, that would be my number one uh, dream is, is if Malik Neighbors falls to me at six. Um, I really think he's – put it this way. You cannot name the three best players in this draft without naming Malik Neighbors, in my opinion. Like, you can't leave him off the list. He has to be in there in the top three. He is that good of a player. Um, and I still like Marvin Harrison Jr. as my top receiver, but Malik Neighbors is right there. Um, I'm bummer he's not going to work out this week. But um, I'm not too worried about it. I know what he brings. I know what he offers. Uh, the acceleration, what he can do after the catch, all of that. 
get it on my team, and I've got an X. I've got a, a difference maker, and that's something I think this Giants team could, no matter who the quarterback is, give me a guy mm. like that, explosive option. Nobody had more explosive plays this year than Malik Neighbors. He had 34 of them. Uh, I'm a big believer in explosive plays translate. The guys that create them in college usually create them in the NFL. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, I, I'd be looking at Neighbors and finding a way to come away with him. Are, away you, with him. are you convinced yet? <laughs> oh, I'm a Naduze guy. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I, I get it. Oh. Uh, he's he, no he knows I'm a skyscraper guy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Plexico Burris transformed Eli Manning and that Giants mm-hmm. team into a Super Bowl champion, and I will never, ever turn down a skyscraper sure. who can make big plays. Well, and he, yeah, he's 6'3", 220, and he's going to run a 4'3 here. I mean, he is a good player. There's no doubt. And his ability to finish through contact is outstanding. Um, he's he's a very quarterback friendly target, mm-hmm. no doubt about it. And so, if let's just say quarterbacks go one, two, three, and then Marvin Harrison Jr. goes four, Malik Neighbors goes five, I, I'm bummed I miss out on Malik Neighbors, but I'm not crying about it because I feel great about Radunze at six. Um, I, I think he gives you a lot of what you're looking for in the next receiver. And again, I think that's a, something this team could really use. I need to ask you about Bowers for a minute because nobody questions his skill set. Right. His talent, his ability is insane. I have seen some people say, though, boy, if he measures 6'2 or even a tad less at the combine, that may take some of the glitter off of him. How do you stand on that? And where does he fit into the top 10? Because he may be a top 10 talent but he may not get picked up there because of the positional thing. Right. He's a guy that's easily one of the top 10 players in this draft, but finding a home for him in the top 10 when you do like a mock draft, it's tough. Um, But yeah, he is, you're right. The talent, the skill set is outstanding. Uh, The way he can run routes, the way he can get open, what he does at the catch point, and then after the catch, he's tremendous. Mm -hmm. He's like a running back after the catch. He's a master of the hidden yards. Yeah. Yeah. It's seven yard gains for most tight ends. He finds a way to get 11, you know, and he's he's just so unbelievable at that. Um, So if he's, I don't know, like watching him at Georgia, like he's not a big guy. Like, you know, it's not like he uh, is all of a sudden, it's like a shock that he's not a big guy. Like, you know, we can watch the film and see that he's probably six, two and a half, 235 pounds, you know, and that's, you have to be okay with him as a hybrid player. Not everybody's going to be okay with that. Not everyone should be uh, okay with that because they won't know how to use him, but he can line up in line. He can line up in the slot. He can Mm -hmm. line up out wide. As long as you have a plan for him and just all the different things he can do for you, I, I would not fault anybody for taking him that high. But I, I, I get the when you talk about drafting a tight end that you look around the league and you see a uh, tight end was a second rounder. This is like a third rounder, fourth rounder. And you don't have to spend the first round pick, especially a top 10 pick on uh, the position. I get it. But again, I think this is a special player that can really be a weapon for you if you know how to use him correctly. Dane, good stuff, my man. Anytime. Always a pleasure. Good to see you. Awesome. Dane Brugler you from too. The Athletic. Check out The Beast when it comes out in April. I'll have him on again in the Giants huddle. And, of course, check out the Prospect to Pros podcast. We'll be back with more Big Blue Kickoff Live presented by Cadillac. Brad Spielberger from Pro Football Focus talks for agency coming up next. It's a thread. A love affair. I fell in love with the Giants. I saw LT run the touchdown back when they killed the Detroit Lions. Passed down. Phil Simms was my dad's guy. From generation. Eli was my guy. To generation. Giant special. We are. The New York Giants. Most used emojis is laughing emojis. <laughs> My all-time favorite character of Marvel is the Black Panther. I feel like being the first black character. Me being able to see that at this phase of my life, I like to support him. One thing about me that a lot of people don't know is that I'm 20 years old. You're young. You're so young. <sighs> my biggest pet peeve is Russian. Rushing around, scrubbing around, unorganized. Rush? You wanna rush? It's a thread, a bond. They are the epitome of what we try and be a love affair. Hi! Yeah, for the 
Eli Manning, first jersey I ever owned. Giants on three! One, two, three! Giants! I'd love to be a wide receiver for Daniel Jones. Caught! Touchdown, Giants! We are the New York Giants. All right, we're back here on Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Football Giants. John Schmelk, Paul Dottino, joined by front of the program from Pro Football Focus, Brad Spielberger. If you look at their free agent rankings and the contract projections on PFF, he's your guy. You also hear him on the PFF NFL podcast as well from time to time. Brad, good to see you, man. How are you? Good to see you guys. Doing fantastic. Now, obviously, it's the combine. It's all about the draft prospects, but people lose sight of the fact that free agency comes first. And it oftentimes will change all these teams' needs before you get to the draft. Big time. So it's the start of this. You want to fill holes in free agency to free you up in the draft, right? So why don't we start with the Giants' own guys first? Saquon Barkley is obviously the big story. And it sounds as though, though Joe Shane would not rule it out when he talked to the media yesterday, he would not rule out the franchise tag. Right. Let's assume the tag does not get put on him. When he gets to the open market, what do you think that market's going to look like when teams are trying to bid on Saquon Barkley? I think the other cool thing about this week in, in combining the draft and free agency is, and it applies to this, this question here, is like, how do teams feel about the draft class out of position? They get to meet these guys, go through medicals, go through testing. Do they think, okay, we can draft a replacement, or do they say, we need to sign this guy, right? Like, we need to attack free agency because there are not answers in April. So, and it seems like that is the case this year. There's not a lot of buzz about this draft class at running back, really, at all. So, I do wonder if a true three-down guy, catch the ball, pass protect, obviously run the ball, um, is still going to get a decent deal. Again, the running back market's tough. I think it will be above $10 million a year. Okay. How much so? is the question, but I do think there are a couple teams, maybe like a Houston, you know, didn't really have an efficient run game last year, have the rookie contract quarterback, like they just say, you know what, let's just get a guy for C.J. Stroud, take the pressure off him, they run the ball a ton on early downs, he can catch the football out of the backfield, so I think it'll be, I have it at three years, 12 and a quarter million per year, okay. maybe that's a little bit generous, uh, it's basically the Nick Chubb deal from a couple years ago, um, you know, it's a tough market, but I think the draft is key, it's not sounding like a lot of teams like these draft prospects. Are you buying the Chargers thing. They like a bajillion, and I think that's the technical <laughs> number, a bajillion dollars over the salary cap. I don't see how they can make that work. No, don't buy it at all. No, okay. I, I mean, I think, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think people just know Harbaugh wants to run the ball, and they just, oh, well, you know, <laughs> there you go. Right there. Yeah. yeah, probably played him at Penn State, so maybe there's some familiarity there. All right, two-part question. Number one, how much does this extra money under the cap that we suddenly found last week going to help some of these teams keep some of these guys without letting them get out there? And then the second part is, Barkley coming off a sub-1,000 yard season, I say that helps the Giants because of the incentive packages that you can put in are now more easily reachable for him. You could not have put them in if he had run for 1,300 yards last year. So I think both of these things could help Barkley remain a Giant. Yeah, whereas last year, like you had, what, 1,350 rushing yards and all these very lofty numbers. So, yeah, the, the cap thing's interesting. I talked to a couple teams this past week. For them, they thought it was going to be 247, 250 range coming into probably about two weeks ago. So it is still some found money. Five to $8 million is still nice. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, it's a massive, massive jump. I think what it does is it really comes down to one or two decisions. So I, Saquon could be, could be that decision. Like an Ashawn Robinson, was he maybe a guy you thought you couldn't keep? Now maybe he can keep him. Like, it's a good one. I think it's one or two decisions where you maybe were, were leaning a certain way and now you feel more confident in bringing a guy back. The running back market, I find this fascinating. Not the money part of it, but the volume of really good running backs that are available. Mm. So how do you see this playing out? Like, is this a huge game of chicken now where these which running back is going to pull the trigger first and sign the deal? Do you want to be the first one through the door and then set the market? Or do you think if you go in first and another team gets desperate, they're going to go over you? How do you think the speed of those guys signing within that negotiating window and then when the league year starts is going to work with so many high-level running backs looking like they're not going to get franchise tagged by their teams. It's a very good point, especially because, again, some teams may th might think they can spend way lower and still get 80% of their production. I think you do want to be first. Because how many teams do we think are out there that are willing to spend top-of-market money on running back? It's probably a short list, right? So, so jump at it if you get the shot I at think it, so. right? Yeah, I think so. All right, what about Xavier McKinney, the other high-profile free agent that everybody's talking about around Giants land? We've even seen some people talk about, well, maybe they'll throw his transition tag on him. I'm not so sure that that works, but where is the safety market, which we saw last year, to be quite depressed? 
not quite running back, but it's yeah, not a strong market, particularly in free agency. I think there's just a, a a lot of players at the market, and then also, and McKinney is a guy that can come down in the box, make plays, can make plays against the run. But certain players that are you know deep third free safeties viewed as guys where they just keep everything in front of them. They're they're ball hawks, sure, but like that market's not very strong, and that isn't really McKinney. I think for him, you're looking at a very important contract with Grant Delpit in Cleveland towards the end of this season. Mm. Gets an early extension, former second round pick, good versatile player, mm-hmm. can line him up all over, good ball skills when he does, does get near the, the football. I think that you know that's 12 and a half per year, maybe a little bit more because you go to free agency. So not top of market, but I, I think a strong mid-tier deal for Xavier McKinney. All right, going away from the Giants' current players, the Giants need help at guard. It's a problem. And you can find really good guards at free agency for not – you know, killer prices, right? And it's not going to murder your your cap flexibility. Take us through the guard market. Who are some of the guys at the top of the market? And then maybe who are some of the guys that you think you don't have to go to the top of the market to, but you might get some really good value there. Yeah, so the good news is I think it's maybe the best position in all of free agency. Is it really? Guard. Okay, so great there you news go. For, great news for the Giants. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in terms of value or depth? Both. Both. So I think there are the premium players. Like Kevin Dodson's the big name that I think is going to get a very strong deal. I think does make sense for the Giants, a guy that can work in a gap scheme. We saw last year in L.A. Um, you know, I think that's like you're talking $16, $17, 18000000 million a year. It's a big contract. The guard market has started to kind of reflect the interior defensive linemen. A lot, that happens a lot where one side of a matchup gets a ton of money. They say, well, I'm defending that guy or I'm, I'm blocking that guy. So <laughs> why wouldn't I get more money too? So he's up there. Robert Hunt from Miami also, I think, in that range as yep. well. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are some, so that second tier to me, like Damian Lewis in Seattle, good football player, uh, I think plays with an edge, brings a physicality, I think he's gotten better every year in Seattle. Um, yeah, you're Dalton Risner, who was in Minnesota this past year, right. um, a good pass protector, not great getting to the second level, but a very high floor pass protector. When you go on the list, there's a ton of names, uh, you know, at the guard spot that I think they could certainly should be talking to. It's interesting, the Giants bring in Carmen Brasillo, the former Raiders offensive line coach, to, to handle the team this year, and they got a couple of free agents on the line, one older than the other, but guys who I think people are going to say there might be value there. Greg Van Rotten is a pretty good pretty good offensive lineman still. Yeah, he's the right guard this past year in Las Vegas. Had a good season. A guy that went healthy is a good player. I think with the Jets, he was mostly injured, so he didn't see good tape there. But for him, I'm thinking like $3 million. That's like your real kind of your bargain bin. He's 33 years old now. But, yeah, the other thing is you could you could add multiple players, swing guards, guys that can play you know, maybe center in a pinch, maybe play both left and right guard. There's a lot of those names out there. And then maybe he's your second guy, right? If you bring in the one vet for big money and then you Mm -hmm. want to bring in a second guy in case you don't find one in the draft, then he's your second guy. You can bring in multiple lesser guys, let them compete for the two spots. So there there are certainly different ways to go about that. One spot that we haven't talked a bunch about on the show is three technique for the Giants, right? They traded Leonard Williams. He mans that spot next to Dexter Lawrence. And with their new defensive coordinator, he really values that three technique spot. How does that position group looking free agency if you're looking for a pass rushing defensive tackle. That's a key spot for Shane Bowen, no question. And also good news, that there are some good players there. Look, I think your Justin Meta BKs or Christian Wilkins are probably going to get franchise tag. Chris Jones is not going anywhere. Chris Jones also <laughs> <laughs> definitely not going anywhere. Um, yeah, the big storyline for me when Legarius Sneed stuff came out yesterday was, oh, they must be pretty close with Chris Jones, because he's not going anywhere. It certainly so. sounded that way, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, but there are, again, some good second-tier players. Some injury stuff with DJ Reader coming out of Cincinnati, but a really, really good football player. He's kind of more of a zero-one tech, but I think he can play some three Tech as well uh, and get up field. Quentin Jefferson with the Jets this past year. Shelby Harris in Cleveland. Um, you know, Tyre Tart had a bit of a weird year uh, and obviously has the connection to Shane Bowen, so maybe that's not a great fit, but you know, your Sheldon Rankins, I think, had a bounce back year for the Houston Texans. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, Daquan Jones in Buffalo had a really, really good first half of the season, so a lot of names there that, again, you're not really breaking the bank. That's I mean, mid-tier. I have Rankins at 10 million, Jefferson at three, uh, you know, just rattling off numbers here, but, you know, like, uh, good players that I think you need next to Dexter Lawrence. We know very well what kind of player Leonard Williams is. He gets traded to Seattle in midseason and puts up bigger numbers in Seattle than he did with the Giants. Now, he is an unrestricted free agent, and when he left or when he was traded, there was a door left open there about coming back to the Giants. What kind of number is he looking at? Is he going to be outpriced for the Giants to even think about? I think so. I think it's probably part of the calculation on their end was we don't want to get a compensatory pick. We want to get a second-round pick and a fifth-round pick. I do think that it was handled very, very amicably. Like, you don't always hear Leonard said, yeah, Joe mm-hmm. came to me. He told me. He was honest with me. You know, he, he, he kind of tipped me off the situation. There are players that find out on Twitter that they're moving their family to a new city, yeah. like, right. which is tough. And it's, I get it's part of the business to a degree. But 
It doesn't have to be. And I think there was a mutual respect there. I have him getting three years, $51 million, so a big contract mm, because wow. you get the added leverage of— Good for Leonard. Good for Leonard, yeah. I mean, his first deal with New York was fantastic as well. Um, he's done a very, very good job financially, but it's because of the trade leverage. When you get traded for premium draft capital, you kind of can hold that over the new team and say, you've already invested a lot in me. You can't let me go now. you got, you got to pay me. Um, and he was great in Seattle, too. I think he's maybe the best player on that defense second half of the season. Yeah. I think we had that same conversation with the Giants traded picks from three years ago. Probably. <laughs> I think we had that same He's a good player. And then he got 363. Yeah, so. and then he did. Absolutely. Uh, two other spots I want to touch on, Paul. Edge and corner, because I think yeah. those are two big spots. Giants need pass rushers, right? Kayvon Thibodeau, we know what he is. He's, he's going to be one of your starters. Aziz Ojolari has not been able to stay healthy. They don't really have anybody else. Uh, so your thoughts on the edge class and, and, and what that's going to look like. Obviously, that's one of the more expensive positions if you want to attack that. No doubt about it. But I think there are some situational guys like your Bryce Huffs. Obviously, in New York was a you know rotational designated pass rusher type, but I think he's going to get a pretty good deal and is a very, very good pure pass rusher. His efficiency numbers are off the charts. Off the charts. So mm-hmm. how much do you think teams are going to pay for that? Since, but it is a guy that's maybe not a three-down player. Right. So recent comps, Pernell McPhee a couple years ago in Chicago still got a good deal. Um, even Carl Lawson to a degree in Cincinnati had a similar profile. I have him at 350, which sounds like a lot for a, for a you know a no, rotational piece. Right. Yeah, it's half of the Nick Bosa deal at this point. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I think Jonathan Greenard is going to be a name coming out of the combine in particular that people are going to start talking a lot more about. Had a phenomenal season in Houston. Not only 12 and a half sacks, but 9% run stop win rate was one of the highest in the entire NFL for us this past year. He's got ridiculously long arms, like looks the prototypical type of a, I think he can play an even front, odd front, very, very good football player. Um, and then there's a lot of like gadget types, like a Josh Uchi in, in New England, like depending on what you're looking for, um, a lot of good football players. There's a lot of thought that Adore Jackson is going to leave the Giants. His contract is up, and people think that he could get some pretty decent money going somewhere else. If the Giants had to replace him in free agency, even though the corner draft should be deep, yes, should they be looking at some potential bargain guy that they might be able to grab? Yeah, I think so. It's not the greatest market, so I also think Adoria will do okay, maybe better than some people expect. I do think we saw Deontay Banks really take steps last year mm-hmm. and, and close out the year very, very strong, which helps. But there's like, you know, Steven Nelson in Houston had a good year. Um, it, you know, it, it's not a great group at corner, though. I think you really are kind of taking a risk there on like young upside potential or injury guys like a Ronald Darby had a great year in Baltimore, right. but always kind of misses time. Like, that's a tough market to navigate this offseason. How about slot guys? Anyone inside that you think? Because usually you can get those guys on pretty good deals and get effective players and not high costs. There's a couple. I mean, Kenny Moore's the big name. We're in Indy. You know, he's on the stadium <laughs> down, <laughs> down the street. Um, you know, yeah. had, a, had a very good season. I think Miles Bryant with the Patriots is a good good nickel corner as well. So there actually are a couple names there. Trey Herndon in Jacksonville. I think he's a good coverage player. There are a couple names there. Brad, awesome stuff, my man. Appreciate Tell it. Good to see you, man. Find Thank right you. Before we say goodbye. Yes, yes. The free agent list on PFF.com. Check it out. It'll be 250 players uh, next week. Awesome. Brad Spielberger will be back with more Big Blue Kickoff Live. Madeline Burke and Art Stapleton join me right here on the show. We'll be back after this. My most used emoji would probably be the 100 sign. If I could have one superpower, it'd be the power of discernment. You know, being able to know if a person has a pure heart or not. My favorite follow on social media is Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg just posts all day, every day, and it's just, you never know what he's gonna post next. One item on my bucket list is to definitely go to Africa. My biggest pet peeve is when people's breath just, oh gosh, when it's kicking. level with a season ticket membership. And it's intercepted! Deontay Banks! You will receive exclusive benefits like members-only events, game day experiences, and discounts on Giants merchandise at the team shop. Sacked by Timoteau, and the Giants have won! To learn more about a New York Giants season ticket membership, visit Giants.com slash tickets. 
All right, we're back here for our final segment from the Combine in Indianapolis. Big Blue Kickoff Live presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Football Giants. Madeline Burke rejoins us mm -hmm. after Charles Davis rudely just kicked her out. He basically First picked her all. up and tossed her off the seat. <laughs> no, we will not be slandering <laughs> no, Charles we Davis. we love Charles. Charles I is the best. I graciously stepped aside because he had a very limited time that yes. he was very willing to give Madeline us Madeline had of. to literally beg him to sit down in the I, chair. I really she, did. She I was really like, did. please, I insist. This is your, your, People want to hear from you more than me. Now joining us is Art Stapleton, friend of the program. You can check out his All in Giants podcast, and of course, you can check out all his great written Giants content as well. Where are you on Twitter, Art? Where you can find all that stuff? Uh, Art underscore Stapleton, and then it's North Jersey. North Jersey to come up. Yeah, correct. So make sure everybody go check that out. And Art, Madeline, you and I were all checking out the players talking today. I'll just throw it out to you two. Or we'll start with you guys can kind of bounce back and forth here. Who are some of the guys that kind of jumped out at you? Listen to the D linemen and the linebackers at the podium today. Well, I was a little, uh, I went more a local story early, so I'll mention him. Yeah, sure. Uh, Javante Jean-Baptiste, who's a Bergen Catholic kid. He's from Rockland County. You know, McCourty brothers represent in Rockland. Uh, but he's got a lot of Giants connections. He, he not only met with the Giants this week, but um, he's at Notre Dame essentially because Justin Tuck convinced him to go to Notre Dame after he transferred from Ohio State. Texted with Tuck last night. He said he was he was the closer. He made sure he got there. <laughs> and uh, his father grew up a Giants fan. He talked about how, you know, he remembers rooting for the two Super Bowls. And I asked him, I said, well, then you had to envision yourself one day being in the line of Tuck and OC and Strahan. And he said, actually, I was a running back, so I wanted to be Brandon Jacobs. And I thought that was kind of cool. So, um, you know, I think he's really a, a fourth, fifth round pick. I have a big story about his, you know, journey here, which is kind of interesting. But, um, yeah, he's one of those guys that I think the Giants will be looking to add and really add depth to that outside linebacker position at rush package. So I think that that's really what I'm looking at. Well, and and not the only Brandon, Brandon Jacobs, Jacobs guy, yeah, right? Not yeah. the only Brandon Jacobs <laughs> fan. I talked to Penn State linebacker Curtis Jacobs, who grew up a Giants fan, largely because he had the same last name as Brandon <laughs> Jacobs. And you know, as a kid, you want to buy a jersey with your own name on the back of it. And it's like, hey, it works out well. Um, but I have Curtis, so many Schmelk football jerseys you know, at home. There's, there's a, a lot million of, of them. Schmelk is a well-represented <laughs> name in Actually, this league. I was really but, surprised that was the first one I bought as well. <laughs> Schmelk, yeah, I know. I mean, I think there's so out in stores across the league. It's a hard find, but you know. Oh, no one can find them. They're impossible to find. Impossible to find. Uh, but it does have to do with the fact that people are buying them. Yeah. <laughs> Mine just has one E. Yeah. <laughs> it, was a, it was a mistake. It was, yeah, factory <laughs> error there. Uh, but one of the things I loved about uh, Curtis Jacobs is he talked about how, how much he grew up a Giants fan, and Brandon Jacobs actually reached out to him leading up to this process and uh, you know, and spoke to him, gave him some encouragement and some advice. And Curtis is saying, you know, it's amazing when your heroes reach out to you, tell you that you're doing the right thing, and they're proud of you. Like, what kind of an inspiration that must be to this kid who, you know, grows up rooting for this guy. And now he's saying, hey, good luck at the combine. Yeah, so cool, yeah. so cool. A uh, couple of things that I thought were, were, were kind of fun, listening to uh, Darius Robinson, the defensive lineman out of Missouri. Mm -hmm. I was just um, telling Madeline this, so I, you and I talked about it this yeah, morning. Yeah, so was great. he went to school without, he went to Mizzou without a scholarship, mm -hmm. and he basically said to himself, if I don't earn a scholarship of my junior year, much like I think his aunt and one of his parents, I don't remember exactly who it was, I'm going to join the Marines. And he's like, I worked really hard to get that scholarship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he did. And he's now, Darius Robinson had a chance to become an, like an end of the first round pick. And he was a basketball player. He didn't start playing football until his junior year of high school. Mm -hmm. Like, once teams get into a room with a guy like that, that kind of built himself up and was going to literally join the Marines. I mean, yeah. it's the Marines now. Like, that is some Marines. Like, I, that people are going to. Teams are going to love that when they get him in a row. And didn't yeah. he? Was he at the shrine? Was he at the shrine? He was shrine senior, or senior ball. ball he dominated that he blew the up oh there. Gosh, and I, all so of a sudden, good. I think he put himself on the radar for mm -hmm. that first round, like you said. You pointed out, John, when we were talking this morning, watching in front of Robinson, you know, that was obviously a great line. You know, not even a line, but something he revealed. But also the idea, you can tell the pride that he had for Mizzou. Mm -hmm. The fact that all these guys have their hoodies on, you know, it's the combine with their number on the front, not their jersey number, their tag number essentially. Mm -hmm. 
And he had it zipped down to the point where you could actually see the M of the Missouri, Missouri logo. Only so player that had yeah. school swag on. Right? Yeah, and you yeah. knew Only that one. he was really all about Missouri. And I think that was kind of cool. And it kind of shows a little bit of loyalty factor, too. I'm sure that'll come out in his meetings with teams. The idea that, you know, he's a guy that's all about team. He's had to work for, work for it. And now he's kind of reaping the benefits. And, you know, it's not just about the personal story, but yeah. the guy can play. Speaking of meetings with teams, one of the guys that I, I found to be one of the most fascinating personalities, uh, Steel Chambers. He talked about how he likes to flip the script in the meeting, and he likes to be the one to walk in and ask the question. And the question he likes to ask is, what is the biggest animal you think you could fight and win? <laughs> For him, it's a kangaroo. <laughs> he's got... he's. Peak personality, higher energy. Uh, but I- I'm curious for you guys, what's the biggest animal you think you could fight and win? Kangaroos are pretty vicious. Like they, they, they can, they can beat, they beat you up. Kangaroos. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Like they're known in Australia for like trying to like attack dogs. I think like people have to protect their dogs from the kangaroos. I think the biggest one I could fight is a sloth because they're <laughs> big but they're slow. <laughs> sloth is a good idea. That that really is a good. You have idea. to find like a really gentle large animal. Mm-hmm. I'd mm-hmm. say I'd say some of the stuffed animals in, in yeah. my daughter's bedroom. <laughs> yeah, that there might. You go. Be where I want to go with as far as fighting. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little soft when it comes to that. I feel I'm like, a lover, not a fighter. I feel like panda bears are very clumsy, mm-hmm. so I feel like you might be able to like trip them and mm-hmm. like get them into some type of hole, and I think that would create some. You watch these videos of yeah, panda bears tumbling. They have down terrible hills. balance. Yeah, that's true. So I feel true. like you could take advantage of their lack or of balance. Or a baby giraffe. You know, they're still big, but their legs don't work very well. So, you know, if you get them, you know. You know, I'm kind of imagining if, if the Giants were to meet with Mr. Chambers, that the, where this conversation would go yeah. in their suite. Oh, over Dable, would imagine, Dable would have Dable would have But, like, ima- like, this is a way to be memorable, right? I mean, you want to find a way to differentiate yourself across the process. That's one way to do it. Jesse Armstead would pick, like, a, a bear, and he'd probably be right. I think I would. I think Jesse yeah. against the bear would actually be a, a fair fight. Um uh, Leatu Latu was another guy that I thought was interesting. Mm-hmm. He said, "Oh, in my free time, I like to do firefighting." What? Well, this is a guy who went. <laughs> this is a guy who went what? from medically retired to wow. a draft prospect. He's like, like I'm gonna do firefighting when I'm done playing football. Yeah, what? he's like, I'm gonna play football and then be a firefighter. And like, what? Yeah. You know what I thought was was what really interesting plan. this morning. It's awesome. And, uh, I know you. You know, obviously, I think Paul Schwartz from the Post is gonna be on tomorrow, but he made yeah. this point. You know, and I thought it was interesting, so I'll just steal it from him. And yeah, at steal this point. it, please. But just the idea, like, this morning you're at the defensive line and, and the edge guys and the inside backers, and, you know, a lot of these stories are really cool, but it's nobody that all of a sudden jumps off the page. You know, you're not here with a Kayvon Thibodeau. You remember what Kayvon, the group around him that yeah. year had. Holding court. You know, Trayvon Walker, you know, Hutchinson. Uh, so can the top t- can a defensive player squeeze into the top ten in this draft and that, and that kind of sets the tone right like uh, there are going to be a lot of these guys who are going to enter the draft go to a team and say they have a big chip on their shoulder nobody thought i could be a first rounder no one thought i could be this because all of the attention is all on the offensive guys it's kind of an interesting dynamic but i think isn't that the way that the sport is looked at in general in the most like basic way is that the offensive way i mean look at the way that the playoff overtime rules changed to give both offenses the ball is that, you know, defensive players get paid too. And I think as a defensive player, sometimes you got to look at those things. And it's like, yes, okay, the offense can be explosive. It is a very offense heavy, you know, league. And it's, that's where the, a lot of the highlight plays come from. But, you know, you're right. Defensive players probably will have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder, especially if, you know, the offense is looked at as such a priority. In that you way. Know, Jared Verse was actually asked that today. I think Paul might have actually asked I think the question. that's where it came from. And yeah. he said, like, what do you think about the fact that the first 10 players in this draft might be offensive players? And Jared Verse, who was really fun to listen to, you know, he's been in school for a while. He mm-hmm. was only had one scholarship offer to Albany, ended up going to Florida State. He was like, well, look, teams are going to pick the guys they think are the best fit for them, and if that's all offensive yeah. players, that's fine. Yeah. And, you know, he's a guy, and he was also asked, you know, a lot of times these guys that don't get recruited, they have, like, a real ego about it and everything. And, like, oh, you know, only had one, you know, uh, scholarship offer you know do you do you like carry that with you he goes no i was like 6 2 200 pounds coming out of high school i wouldn't have offered myself a scholarship either <laughs> and i just thought it was very refreshing that somebody yeah. is like that self-aware and is like all right i get it yeah what sets you apart from everyone else nothing physically <laughs> nothing you know i'm just a big guy <laughs> work hard uh, i thought also uh, what was interesting is 
the two Penn State guys, the two mm-hmm. Penn State edge guys, Adiza Isaac and Chop Robinson. I mean, talk about two really cool names. The yeah. idea, and I was listening to Isaac, and you know, he was talking about the idea. You know, he was from Brooklyn. You know, that idea of maybe a homecoming. You know, we always got to serve those questions up: Giants, Jets, that kind of thing. And you know, he kept mentioning. Chop Robinson and the idea that you know he I think he even said Chop Robinson made him a better player because the two of them together in the room kind of working each other working their skills on the field and and you know sometimes you hear about the offensive tackle and the rusher kind of working together but they both mentioned Olu Fashino by the way too making right. it better so they both those right. guys did mention him as well and so did John Baptiste he mentioned Joe Alt and talked about yeah. his patience as a tackle so it's interesting to have these team uh, combinations where you know it, it's usually if the talent level is about equal they kind of you know that old bad cliche of iron sharpening iron yeah you know i think it really does matter sometimes when these guys get into a situation and it'll be it'll be fun to kind of watch the way see the way they play out anything well, else at the podium before we jump to giants well and you bring up chop robinson which i need to bring in a full circle moment oh that's the right top we, of the show we didn't finish the story <laughs> we started a story <laughs> uh and i know that fans watching have been waiting with bated breath so uh you know i was I was letting people in on the fact that Tavondre Sweat, of course, being such a big guy, his nickname is Loaf, um, which is up up there on the podium. Chop Robinson, of course, that is a nickname because he was a 14-pound baby. His parents were calling him Pork Chop, but then as he got older and leaned out a little bit, he had to drop the pork and just goes by Chop. But his family still calls him Plump at home. Uh, they don't call him Chop. They call him Plump. He but is his, not Plump, by the way. He's, he's actually not. pretty slender. But again, a 14-pound <laughs> baby, your Mother's Day gifts must be, like, give her the moon. Um, but his name is Damien. Oh, That's you found his, out. I did. Yeah. Well, in the moment, I was like, there was a lot going on. I was like, uh, yeah. Well, uh, I gotta I'll tell, tell you, you, Damien's a very good name. Yeah, like, not he, using Damien is, is yeah. but he pretty spells bold. it. He spells Especially it unique. D e m e i o u n. Oh, Damien. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I believe it's pronounced Damien. But anyway, so that is. Um, my journalism for the day. You're welcome. <laughs> like it. Well done. Mm-hmm. All right, mm-hmm. Art. To um, Pulitzer, you can mail it to the Marriott. No, one of the hotels over here. <laughs> <laughs> and she already gave up the game. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Art, Giants, what, what's your feel for, for pick number six? For, for what the Giants might be thinking there. You, you can know, take this any way you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know they're meeting with all the quarterbacks yep. here. And, you know, that's usually what happens. You meet with the players that may be in line to be in your picks um you know i think joe shane kind of laid it out yesterday and you know it, it's the perfect scenario in which he doesn't have to give you anything right yeah the idea of oh we'll take the best player on the board and you know it might be a quarterback it might be a wide receiver ultimately i think it, it's down to those two positions if they stay at six uh, as long as they like the third guy of that group um, you know, and look, we, we know the ramifications. We know what it means. You know, there's faith in Daniel Jones, but how far does that faith go? And I think Shane's biggest point from yesterday that I think really resonates is that this is the team that, uh, or at least Team Brass, that does not plan on being in the top 10 every year. And the Giants have essentially been in the top 10 every year since the Super Bowl. And the reality is, is that if you want to win and you want to be successful and you want to maintain some sort of continuity, you can't be picking in the top 10 every year. It's great because you get your pick of the players, but if you don't pick the right guy, you're just going to continue to kind of repeat that performance. Endless so, cycle. Right. And I think that when it comes down to quarterback, positional value, the positional value for wide receivers, especially the three that are considered the top of the draft, uh, for the wide receiver spot. Uh, I just think that it matches everything that Joe Shane says he wants to build his team around. Uh, and you can say, let's ride another year with Daniel Jones. Let's see where you are in 2025. And they may do that. But the reality is, is that they hope that they're not picking sixth again next year. So if you're now picking 25th because you had another bounce back and you get into the playoffs, uh, and as much as people may think that's unlikely right now, you don't know what the roster is going to look like. So I think you've got to strike while another iron mm-hmm. is hot. Uh, well, I think hot enough to sharpen another iron. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they have to take advantage of the time. It's the right place, right time. 
if you like a quarterback that's going to kind of take that position to another level. So I think that's where they're at. Well, and speaking of top 10, too, another top 10 number that came out today is eight. Uh, the Giants are eight of 32 teams, according to the NFLPA survey that came out today. And some of the notable high marks are, I know you pointed this out on your social media, Ronnie Barnes uh, finished number two overall in the league. Brian Dable had really high marks in the player evaluation of that, too. When you look at some of these uh results in this survey what do you take from that the giant fans by the way have <laughs> like two of their huge pariahs when you deal with them on yeah. social media right. and oh the players yeah. love the two guys the players who knew? the people who deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis are saying <laughs> oh yeah no we're, we're giving you good marks yeah. on this my, my understanding is that in the surveys there were no complaints about brian dable yelling on the sideline no. that's no. my <laughs> understanding and there wasn't anybody finished, upset yeah he actually finished first in the league in regards to like time management yeah. and how the players feel like their time and and what is taken for or yeah managed and, and let's be honest uh, you know that's been a big part of Dable's coaching from the very beginning I mean mm -hmm. you know you you could say you want to be a player's coach but it's another thing to be able to put together a schedule you know I got to give uh, L.Y. a nice little shout because he always does yeah. Laura, yeah. Young Laura Young is very influential in putting together their plan their practice plan their scheduling and everything else so um, you know I thought that was very interesting the two negatives that they mentioned about the Giants uh you know, one of them was uh, the the lack of a family room mm -hmm. uh, on game days at MetLife, which is kind of a surprise, and then really had to do with MetLife and the idea that, you know, the field surface, which is going to continue to come up year in and year out, especially with, um, you know, the NFLPA seeing what's happening with FIFA and the World Cup. But it was interesting. I mean, I think overall it's positive, especially – you know, there's this idea this off season with everything that happened with the coaching staff that Brian Dable is, you know, losing this team. And I think that's complete opposite of what is actually happening. So, um, you know, I'm sure they'll, you know, I'm sure Dable will be told that if he has not been already and mm -hmm. he'll just kind of shake, shrug and move on to the next one. Yeah. That's, that's really how he is. We're a little over here, Art, but we'll do one more question with you because we haven't talked about free agency, which is also equally important. We have to mm -hmm. get to that before we say March goodbye 13th, to you. March 13th, legal tampering. How do you think this is going to go down with Saquon, McKinney, and then who do you think uh, the Giants player or position they might really try to target uh, from the outside? Saquon, I think uh, they will. it will kind of be a, a good faith. I think Joe Shane kind of put the franchise tag back on the table just so he can take it off ultimately and tell them, look, we won't tag you. You know, go to market, get a price, come back to us, and if you really want to be a giant for life, let's talk it out and see where we're at. That That's my take on it. I think ultimately, unless Saquon is going to take what, what would be considered a below market from where he was last year, um, I, I think the team may be ready to move on. I thought Joe's you know, mentioning Singletary and Moss yesterday at two guys that they had up in Buffalo in a question on your Q&A, which was fantastic. So kudos to you guys and to Thank Joe you. for doing that. Uh, but I, I think I, I, I think I'm, I'm prepared to not have Saquon Barkley in this locker room on this team this year. I don't know if they are. We'll have to see. With McKinney, I don't know if he's going to get, a, you know, a contract that's going to pay him you know, $16 million a year. I don't know if the Giants are prepared for that, but I do know that Shane Bowen's system, you know, Shane made a point yesterday, not Bowen, but Joe, uh, that in Tennessee, Bowen had two safeties, Malik Hooker and uh, Kevin Byard, mm -hmm. and they were both signed to second contracts. So you know safety is going to be a priority in the system. Uh, and then free agency, I think, I think they're going after an edge guy. Uh, I think Joe kind of hammered that yesterday without intentionally trying to hammer that. Is that, you know, Wink system was all about creating pressure with blitz. I think Shane Bowen will look to uh, beef up the front, you know, kind of get to the passer and play the run on the way back. It's kind of the way the Giants did on you know, previous regimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, um, I think. It might be another room for another Huff in Giants history. Maybe Bryce Huff, who Joe Douglas, the Jets general manager, said they are not going to franchise tag. So if he hits the market, it would not surprise me at all with his pass rush rate. Won't be cheap. And the way he plays won't be cheap. But you know what? I, I need to unlock Kayvon Thibodeau 
and the other side. And, uh, you know, I think we all love Aziz Ojolari, but that right now is a big question mark in terms of his history. Until his injuries, he can figure out how to stay on the field. Uh, I'm making a run at another edge guy and saying, you know what, now we've got the guys on the outside. You cannot put all your attention on Dexter and Kayvon. You're going to have to worry about this other guy, and I, I think that's kind of where they're looking for agency. Anything like left it. in your holster? I You're like good. it. No. Art Stapleton, as always. Check it out, NorthJersey.com. You can follow him on Twitter, the All In Podcast with Art Stapleton as well. Is the Dane Brugler episode up yet? Dane Brugler is up, yes. And we're, we're, we've been doing a lot of videos, so thanks to you guys for allowing to use your set yesterday. Videos up on YouTube, trying to make a push on that. So make sure if you prefer you, uh, video, you can check it out on video. Absolutely. You can check out our content on YouTube as well. We're streaming live on YouTube all week long here. So if you uh, want to stream on the Giants app or Giants.com, you can stream us on YouTube and all the archives all of our interviews are on there as well. We're also doing a bunch of Giant Huddle podcasts while we're out there. The Daniel Jeremiah one is up already. That's up on YouTube, the Giants Huddle podcast feed. Giants.com, Giants.com slash podcast, Giants app, favorite podcast platform. Just search plug, for Big Blue Kickoff plug, Live plug, plug. or the Giants Huddle. <laughs> plug it all up. And, of course, folks, uh, Giants.com slash tickets if you want to become a season ticket member. Uh, all the access you want. And, of course, Giants TV is our a TV streaming app where you can download it for free on all your, you know, TV, Apple TV, you know, Fire TV, all that stuff. Make sure you go check that out as well. For Madeline, for Art, for Paul, for Charles Davis, for Dane Brugler, for Brad Spielberger, I am John Schmelk. We're back tomorrow for another Big Blue kickoff at 1230, and Giants Huddles will be coming your way all week long as well. Thanks to our whole crew. We'll see you tomorrow for another edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live. Giants fans, oh. get loud and welcome. Fandom to the next level with a season ticket membership. And it's intercepted! Deontay Banks! You will receive exclusive benefits like members-only events, game day experiences, and discounts on Giants merchandise at the team shop. Sacked by Thibodeau, and the Giants have won! To learn more about a New York Giants season ticket membership, visit Giants.com slash tickets. One, two, three, Giants! Oh, yeah.